Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Well, hey, beautiful people. Today, we are talking to wisdom keeper and sacred sight guide, Oliver Huntley. Oliver weaves together long forgotten teachings from the Gnostics and the Druids. He helps us reconnect to the ancestral magic of our land and its holy history. Dare to Dream podcast won three talk radio positive change awards. Such a mouthful. Also, the COVR award for best radio and podcast show. Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. And it's high ranking under self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. You can find us everywhere and anywhere. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. If you want to find more about their energy work out in the world, go to drdaneherehear.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist. I am a book writing coach. I also take authors' books to a guaranteed international bestseller. You already know that I help people, spiritual messengers specifically, learn how they can be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. But I have a little something, something that's new. And if you're on my newsletters under debbiedashinger.com, you know about this. And if you don't, let me tell you, I have a very rare opening for two people that I work with under publicity. So if you are interested in being booked on radio and podcast, I do all the heavy lifting for you. We could set up a call, but just, you know, be really serious that you have time in your calendar to do this. I prefer to work with people who have been doing their business for a bit not brand new. And I also prefer to work with people who have some sense of being interviewed, whether they've been very successful or not, I can help out there, but that you've been on media. So that's better fit for me and that you have the money to do this. That's good too. Uh, And then finally, that you have some longevity because the best game is the long game. It's not the one month, one and done. You know, you're not going to really gain momentum and visibility, but if you really want some magic and miracles to happen for your being, for your message that you came here to share, for your business, the long game, better thought. So if that fits you and you'd like to work with me as a publicist, I can see if we're a fit and set up a call. Write to me at support at debbiedashinger.com. Remember, it's D-E-B-B-I. D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R, support at debbiedashinger.com. Well, my guest today is Oliver Huntley, wisdom keeper, writer, storyteller, teacher, sacred sight guide, currently deepening his connection to the land and mysteries of ancient whales while writing his first book. And Oliver is on a sole mission to bring back the lost mystery school wisdom, initiations from the Druids, Gnostics, and a lost Celtic Christianity. Oliver has over 10 years of experience in holding land-based retreats all over the world, specializing in the unification of the Gnostic and Druid mysteries of Avalon, Glastonbury, and Simru, Wales. Mamma mia, that's so exciting to me. You can find out more about him at the Gnostic Druid.com. And something notable, Oliver Huntley and I, Debbie, are both one of the many notable speakers that are appearing in September at the Portal to Ascension Glastonbury UK conference. This is sacred land, people. So that is part of why we're hearing for from Oliver, I know that I'm going to be with him and hopefully go on a tour. And I'm going to have a link in the show notes. If you would like to join us in September in Glastonbury, one of the sacred sites, please do. And with that, I welcome the amazing Oliver Huntley to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you. 
Thank you so much, Debbie, for welcoming me on your podcast. And it was actually really fun for me just to witness and receive the transmission you were giving, even just in the intro, because just something about those light blues that you're wearing now, you have this almost like shamanic celestial mermaid quality that was coming out, almost like you can felt like you could swim through different realms or dimensions all at once. And the way you can articulate these many different realms or these many different worlds. Yeah, I just, I really appreciate not only that quality in you, but really that's the frequency. It seems like you're, you're transmitting through this show. So thank you for that. Oh, that's so beautiful. I really appreciate your kind words. I want to start with the Druids. So Mm. in Irish language literature, the Druids are the sorcerers. These are the people who have supernatural powers, and they were very respected in society, especially Mm -hmm. for their ability to perform divination. And Mm -hmm. uh, the dictionary in the Irish language defines Druid as magician, as wizard, or diviner, or diviner. And I want to find out more from you, your understanding, your expertise about who the Druids were and how do we find our way to those supernatural powers? I love that question. It feels like something about the Druids now is speaking to a lot of people. For me, when I divine or when I need to sense the kind of psychic field of the world, sometimes I can just use social media because you get to see, you know, what people post, what they're talking about, what they're sharing about. And what I notice coming up in the feeds a lot is so much of an energy pointing to the land, people wanting to connect more to the natural realms, the elemental kingdoms, and also talking about the Druids, because as you were saying earlier, they have all these different titles that seem to revolve around someone who connects to other realms, other worlds, and especially someone who functions as a bridge between these realms. And this is largely what the Druids are, what they did, and and what they still do. And so the Druids, if you are to kind of sum up who and what they are, they're kind of the indigenous shamanic people of the ancient British Isles. But for me, one of the most exciting things about the Druids is they didn't write anything down, right? Mm-hmm. So they didn't commit anything really to, to written, written language or written communication. A lot of it was transmitted orally and required different druids to memorize things or to really become of the vibration to embody things non-verbally and so for people like me and many people who want to know more about the druids it's kind of a a double-edged sword in some ways because there's not a lot written down so we don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge from the druids with them and their voice explaining what they did and that can be frustrating because you know if we really want to know, it's great to learn from the people themselves. But what we do have is we have a wealth of secondhand accounts of the Druids. So people that were around them, people from other cultures kind of looking from the outside onto them. And then you get to hear what do these other cultures have to say about the Druids. So you're kind of pairing this secondhand knowledge of the Druids along with a lot of their sacred sites that you find all over the UK. And so bringing together what we know archaeologically from these Druidic sites, and then also the stories that other cultures tell about the Druids. And of course, a lot of people like me, when you connect with the Druidic consciousness, you can intuitively feel certain things. You put all those kind of elements together, and a story starts to emerge, an energy, an essence of the Druids starts to emerge. And that's largely what I focus my work on, helping people into these Druidic realms of the natural world, the elemental world, connecting to Earth and seeing that the downward path of descension is as important as the upward ascension path connecting up. And the Druids, to me, were someone who really embodied that connection between the two, to go down, to go up, to go up, to go down, as below, as above, all these different connections, but you need both sides present. And so the Druids really understood, at least it felt that way, how to bridge the worlds, how to bridge heaven and earth together. And their culture largely embraced that, embodied that, and taught through that lens. How did you get introduced to the Druids? I hope it was a mystery. I hope, I hope <laughs> something came to you and you had to figure out what it was and you went on some kind of journey, some kind of hero epic journey. But but what was your introduction and then what caused you to say, I, I have to follow this? I have to go deeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I would answer that both in kind of a spiritual and pra- pragmatic way where 
I feel my ancestry is all from the UK. I was actually born in London, even though I grew up in the States, why I have an American accent. But my ancestry, my blood lineage is woven really deeply into the lands here. And I've had many, you could say, past life experiences connecting to my soul essence as, as a druid in different times. So I'm kind of going into the reservoir of that kind of innate soul knowledge. And then where in this lifetime, things really catalyzed and opened up for me is when I was studying the life of Yeshua, which was the Aramaic name of Jesus. And what really fascinated me about the life of Jesus was what's known as his lost years. And so most people, when we think of Jesus, especially the biblical Jesus, all we really know is that when Jesus was born, right? He's this special, magical, you know, divine God baby. And then about 33 years later, so he pops up on the scene and he's suddenly God in form. And, you know, that in itself is a very interesting story. It made up the Bible. And we certainly know a lot about those two ends of his life. But what about, you know, the kind of central part of his life? What did he do? What did he do in his younger life when he was a younger child, an adolescent, you know, coming into his manhood and his adulthood? There's this huge span of you know a long time that we don't really know at least the bible anyways doesn't tell us a lot about it and so that kind of mystery really enthralled me i just wanted to to know as much as i could and during that process of researching and diving into and trying to compile all these different references and apocryphal sources of his life uh, what came up is most likely he traveled during these lost years and What seems to be his kind of uh, itinerary, you could say, is he traveled to different mystery schools, teaching centers of spirit in different places in the planet. And so one of those places that they say he traveled to was ancient Albion, which was the old name of the ancient British Isles. And he studied with the Druids here during his adolescent years. And I, you know, it's a a story, just something exciting opened up in me. It's like, I want to know more. He studied with the Druids. Who are the Druids? You know, what, what goes on in these ancient British Isles that was so important for Jesus to learn from and to be initiated into this Druidic culture. And so that is, I was living in Bali at the time, and I knew that I needed to, in many ways, recreate Jesus's pilgrimage during his lost years, go to some of the places that they said he went to. And so one of the places that I traveled to was I went from Bali back to the UK to kind of continue this Christed pilgrimage. And while I was there, something just completely opened up in me. My life actually really changed on every level where I moved from Bali to the UK and I haven't left since. So Mm -hmm. something was so magnetic, so important during that um, trip back to the UK that it was like my soul was being reactivated and I knew I needed to be plugged into, rooted into the earth here, into the land here, so that some mysteries could open in my life and also as as part of my service to the world. And so that's where the Druids really made made their mark in my life. And in many ways, it felt like the Druids were were calling me home for another lifetime again, uh, yeah, to continue the, this great lineage of teaching. I think it's really interesting that you compared the Druids to the shamans. Can you explain mm. that? How are the Druids shamanic in nature? Absolutely. So, I mean, shaman is a, is a very wide term, I'm sure you know, and you, you can look at it in different ways. And the way I, in any ways, define being a shaman or the shamanic qualities is, again, that ability to see through the world or to connect through the world or to walk through different realms or yeah. planes of existence, right? They they are the gatekeepers. They are the, the key masters, however you want to say it. And so they can both physically and etherically, psychically, energetically, however you'd like to say it, can traverse these many realms. And what we hear in a lot of the Druidic culture and a lot of the references to the Druids is they could exactly do that. They could walk between the realms. They could go and connect with the earth spirits, but at the same time, they could talk to the celestial beings and understand the light that would shine down from the stars. So they really were a culture of people who could shamanically connect to different worlds. And we certainly see that within a lot of Celtic mythology and Celtic culture about the ability to go from this realm, this physical reality, into other realms or other worlds of existence. And the shamans were the ones who could really facilitate that, who could teach that, who could help initiate people into going between the realms. Was Merlin, Merlin the magician, was he a druid? So you don't necessarily find Merlin depicted as a druid in itself. 
but he certainly hung around with a lot of Druids and a lot of his life story and his life mission, you could say would be Druidic because he was a magic user. He was a wizard. He was a sorcerer, you know, all the different terms that we have for magic users. But in Celtic mythology, we find a lot of the idea of Merlin. And when you get into Celtic mythology, you quickly realize that Merlin doesn't necessarily mean just one person. It's kind of like a term or it could be a collection of different, you know, wizards or sorcerers given the term Merlin or Merlinus or the different ways in which we describe him. But a lot of the legends talk about Merlin connecting with elemental beings or the fae, right? The different fairies or the sprites, all these different things. And that he would be able to go through what's known as thin places, which are places on the earth where the kind of bridge or the, the you know, the separation between the worlds is very thin it's very permeable and so merlin would often go to these elemental spirits and creatures and beings and commune with them learn from them play with them in some ways and go between the realms so merlin certainly for me checks the box if he wasn't you know officially a druid he certainly behaved like a druid yeah that's so cool that he's a collective or an archetype very yeah. powerful I, mm -hmm. so because they did the supernatural and because they learned the way to affect things, to change things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually, I'm even thinking as I say that out loud, that is also shamanic because shamans can change. They always say they can change the weather like magicians. So they mm -hmm. have abilities somewhat like that too. So if somebody wanted to learn for good, I have to preface it by saying for good, for <laughs> positive, for the benevolent, for the light wanted to learn these supernatural powers is there a place where we can learn divining where we can learn magic wizardry all of that the druid way mm -hmm. in the uk there are many different druidic schools kind of modern day druidic mystery schools and i love them all because they're all essentially helping people return to an ancestral connection of magic right uh, of this ability for us to connect to these other realms and really to connect to nature and the magic that we find in nature. So if anyone's looking for Druidic schools, and, and actually I know there's quite a few in the States that offer, you know, kind of Druidic initiations, Druidic teachings, and they all, the way I describe them is they're all kind of like ice cream. They're just different flavors of ice cream. So you can kind of go and see the menu and pick the ice cream that you like, because everyone brings a different flavor, a different quality, a different style of teaching. So if people want to go to kind of an organized school, like one of these modern day Druidic mystery schools, you know, just let your intuition guide you find someone that resonates with you, a certain teaching that really speaks to your soul or a certain geographic location on the planet that really magnetizes you trust those things. But for me, the, the greatest teacher and the thing that can really help everyone connect to this Druidic path is just spend as much time in nature as you can to spend as much quality and conscious time in nature as you possibly can, because really everything that the Druids can do and did do is an innate and normal ability that we all have. It just, for most of us, it's dormant, it's sleeping. We don't connect to it very often. It's like a muscle that's atrophied because we don't use it. And sometimes just spending a lot of time in nature, just being present, being aware, letting the magic of the natural world reactivate these certain qualities within us. And we know even on a science-based science biological level, spending time in nature supercharges our immune system. It helps untangle, you could say, nervous system traumas. So it can really have physical biological effects. So if it's affecting us in physical ways, why can't it be affecting us in spiritual ways? And it certainly is. And that's why the Druids always felt just being outside was their church, was their place to meet God because nature has that quality, that divine quality that can speak to us and really, really help us rise up. It sounds like you're the land whisperer. So <laughs> Oliver, how do you commune with the land? How does it talk to you? How does it give you wisdom or guidance, or information, direction, all of that? Yeah. Learning the language of nature, I think, is really fun. It's it's because nature speaks to everyone differently. Sometimes you can hear it audibly. Sometimes it's what you see. Sometimes it's what you smell or what you feel. 
even sometimes just seeing a bird fly by means something or the way the leaves rustle in the wind is communicating these these messages to you. So nature has this beautiful language that speaks to everyone differently. And it's about learning how to become open and sensitive enough to feel that. And so I know when I go out into the natural realms, I'm feeling, I'm someone who's a big feeler. I can feel what, what, I guess can only be communicated like waves of energy or or insights that might come in when I'm in certain areas. I can be outside, perhaps at, at a ruin of a location, and I'll actually start to feel what happened there long time ago. So if there's certain events happen there, whether it's very happy, perhaps traumatic or sad, I'll start feeling that. So something in me is almost like a natural dowsing rod. So I'm in out when I'm out in nature, I'm really spending time feeling and and not so much looking anywhere or looking for things, but allowing nature to to talk to me through these feelings. And that's something that I really appreciated about the Druids that we still, it's kind of a mystery we haven't been able to solve yet because the Druids were able to sense what, you know, we call today ley lines, but in Druidic culture, ley lines are a little bit different than how we commonly think of ley lines, where most people, when we imagine ley lines and conjure that vision up in our in our mind, we think of very geometric straight lines that are gritting, gritting the planet and, and very much ley lines um, can be understood that way. But for the Druids, they were slightly more, you could say, organic, where the Druids looked at ley lines in three different categories. You have metals, you have minerals or crystals, and then you have waterways. And so the Druids looked at the ley lines that were based on, if we're looking at metals first, where are the deposits of very special metals like gold, like silver, like lead, metals that seem to have certain metaphysical qualities. The Druids would understand understand metallurgic ley lines going through the earth and they were able to actually feel them to sense them and they would map where these special places are in the world based on metals they would also do this based on minerals or crystals where they'd understand where all the quartz veins were that permeate the ancient british lands somehow they're able to sense these mineral or crystalline deposits and they were even able to sense water waterways and so the third way the druids would look at ley lines is underground rivers both rivers on the surface but largely underground rivers the way they would snake and flow through the land and so druids were able to find these pockets of metals under the earth these pockets of minerals and crystals where rivers would flow under earth and even more importantly and we can talk more about this later is what happens when underground rivers cross the druids could sense these things they they understood where these places were and they would largely build sacred sites their sacred sites on top of these places and only in modern science can we detect things like these underground rivers where these metal deposits are where these mineral deposits are so how did the druids do it what what was their magic? And we we might not know for sure, but for me, when I imagine that, they could feel it. They absolutely could feel it. It's a it's a term or a craft called geomancy, which is the ability to feel telluric or earth energy currents and spots. And so the druids could do this. And we don't know how they did it, but they certainly did it simply based on the evidence we have of their sacred sites being placed on these important sites where these metals, minerals, and waters were. And that largely helps me again understand what I'm perhaps doing when I'm out in nature and I'm feeling because I'll feel these pockets of energy. I'll feel where these thin places are. I'll feel where these these hot spots are for spiritual presence. It's something I don't really know how it's operating, but I know it's operating and I'm cultivating the ability to do that more and more. Hmm. Well, then I have to follow you up on the question. What does happen when these underground rivers cross? What's going on mm. and what do they create? Yeah, something about when rivers cross creates a vortex point, a nodal point, right? A, a portal, if you will, sometimes a chakra energy point, How all the beautiful terms we have to list this. And what fascinates me most about understanding water as a ley line in the Druidic culture is that when you have, you know, let's say metal deposits or you have crystal deposits somewhere, those deposits are largely fixed. They're not really moving within the earth, although they're slowly moving, but not really moving for, for all intents and purposes. But water is very different because water has a very specific or very important spiritual importance, one in almost every culture that's out there. But water has an interesting quality because water is always flowing. It's always moving. In many ways, it kind of represents like the dragon lines, if you will, the way the dragon's tail moves. 
And the way the Druids would map these waterways is not only would they map where waterways were as they are at the time, they were actually able to generate future maps of sacred sites. And the reason they could do that is because they understood as water would flow through, let's just say rock, let's say water is flowing through a lot of rock that has gold, for instance, in it. They understood that the water is actually slowly eroding the gold and the rock, and then taking that gold and redepositing it in other places, or if it's flowing through quartz crystal, or if it's flowing through any important metal or mineral, the water is actually slowly eroding it, changing the landscape and, and moving it in many ways, and many times, redepositing these important spiritual metals, minerals, and crystals in other locations. So they actually were able to generate maps, like we generate maps of the cosmos and moving of celestial bodies, stars, planets. They could see that certain land areas would shift in their spiritual energy as the waters would change and bring different minerals, bring different metals to different places. And so when you have underground rivers, when underground rivers cross number one, you're bringing these two energy currents together, but you're also bringing two different qualities or consistencies of water. Sometimes one water might be rich in iron, which is largely magnetic, very healing. The other water might be very rich in calcite crystal, for instance. And we bring these two components together, something very magical, alchemical takes place. And that's one of the reasons why holy wells and springs were so important to Druids because they understood that certain springs, certain wells would have different infusions into the water. So if this well has a lot of iron rich water, it's good for certain ailments. It's good for treating certain diseases, or this well might be really good for this ailment or this disease. And so we have a lot of these wells around the UK that from a folklore standpoint, they're like, oh yeah, you go here if you have this you know, medical issue. But there's actually truth to why they say that. There's actually a scientific reason as well as the spiritual meaning why these holy wells and springs and waterways were so important and carried such qualities to them. And the Druids knew that. Again, they, they knew that perhaps without even knowing why, or maybe they did and we're, they were so far advanced <laughs> that we couldn't quite understand what, what they were doing even today. Now, when we're in Glastonbury together in September, where are you taking us? <laughs> what do I have to look yeah, forward to? <laughs> there's a few places that we'll be stopping in Glastonbury. And so Glastonbury is one of my favorite places in the UK because it's just so rich in history through so many different timelines. Like Glastonbury really offers people a unique experience because there's parts of Glastonbury that actually date back far older than the pyramids, you could say. And there's a living tradition that goes into the kind of the, the mists of time and history, then goes all the way up to the time of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, really the biblical epic, then goes after that into the formation of the Celtic church and the early Celtic Christian era, and then into medieval times. And so you'll find this huge huge range of sacred sites in Glastonbury. And there's something for everyone, depending if you're really connected to the Druids and earth magic, or if you're really connected to Yeshua, Mary Magdalene and the Holy Family, or if you're connected more to the Celtic Church, the early saints. So you can get something that's very intellectual and historically interesting. And you can also get things that are also very spiritual and engaging and activating for people. So it's a beautiful mix of everything. And so we'll be stopping at a few different places in Glastonbury. We won't have, unfortunately, enough time to see all of the sites that I'd love to see, but we'll be seeing some very key and important sites. Uh, one of those will be something called the Tor, which is one of the three hills that's in Avalon. And there's a lot of very special energy or magic there that's connected to the masculine, not necessarily for just men only, but when we understand how do we open up the archetype of the masculine. We'll be going to two different springs. One is called the Chalice Well, which is the Red Spring. It's very famous. It's one of the kind of must go to places if you're going on a priestess or goddess pilgrimage. Um, and then we'll also be going to the White Spring. So when you have the Red Spring and the White Spring, these two energies, again, alchemically coming together, bringing the masculine, the feminine, or the polarities together, we'll have an opportunity during this retreat to visit, to connect with both these waters and also more importantly, drink these waters. And in some cases, we can even go into the waters, which is really, really exciting. And then we'll be going to another place called the Glastonbury Abbey, which has foundations in one of the oldest churches in the entire world. And they say, some people like to say that it was founded by Yeshua Jesus himself. Other people say it was um, Joseph of Arimathea. Some people say it was Mother Mary, all these different things, which is very interesting. We'll talk about all the 
the spiritual lore around it. But what is true with the Glastonbury Abbey is that it is one of the oldest churches in the world. And so when you're there, you get to connect to these energies that connect to people who were literally there. You know, they're not just some, you know, disconnected, disembodied, you know, energy that we like to think about. These are actually people who walked the earth and they walked the earth where the Glastonbury Abbey once stood. And then as with most kind of early Celtic Christian sites in the UK, if you go deeper, you know, both actually in time going further back, but actually physically going deeper, they're built on even older sites. And most of the time they're ancient Druidic sites. And so the Glastonbury Abbey before the kind of early Celtic Christian times used to be the center or the main temple, you could say, of Avalon. And so we're going to be going through these layers. You know, I describe it like lasagna, you just one delicious layer after the other. And you really get to um, yeah, go literally on a pilgrimage through time, but also through energetic space, connecting with all these different aspects. And people get to connect with and resonate and vibrate with, you know, what they're most interested in. Oh my God, that sounds so divine. Thank you for sharing all of that. I am really excited. I'm excited. It's you. So Glastonbury Abbey lasagna. <laughs> that's what I'll be thinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a great idea um, in reference to this trip and this tour. I want to speak, as you brought up Christianity. So I want to also speak a little bit about the Gnostics. First of all, who spelled the word G N O S T I C S? Why why the Gnostics? <laughs> the Gnostics, yeah. Well, it, it comes from a term that's gnosis, right? And and really how you can understand gnosis or or what the Gnostics were talking about largely is that to be in gnosis is to be in a sense of knowing, but it's not necessarily this knowing from an intellectual level. It's this deep feeling, right? It's almost, you could say, the intelligence of the heart. So in gnosis and to the Gnostics, really what they're teaching is that there is no intermediary between your heart and the divine or your heart and God or your heart and your higher power, whatever it might be, is that there is a direct and uninterrupted link between the two. You don't have to go to see this person necessarily. You don't have to go to this religious you know, place or establishment. There is a connection that goes right from your heart to God. And how do you become aware of that direct connection? How do you cultivate that connection? How do you strengthen that connection? So a lot of the Gnostic teachings were around this direct communion of your heart and right to God. And they were based off of teachings, yes, combined teachings from both Christianity and the Jews, right? Jewish Christianity, which is very interesting mm -hmm. that they came together in that way. Exactly. I mean, in, even more than that, they were, it's kind of like they were picking uh, different traditions, different cultures. And the, even the term Gnostic is, is very broad. It, it's kind of an umbrella term that a lot of different spiritual lineages get brought under this one umbrella. But they really all come from a deep mystical connection, almost an esoteric or direct mystical connection of the divine, seeing that we can form this direct relationship to God, in many ways becoming God, not in an egoic or hubris way, but seeing that we can become the embodiment of God directly within us. So we don't have to necessarily go anywhere. We're not reliant on anything else. We are vibrating. We are resonating. We are becoming the embodiment of the divine in our own life, which you see at the core of all the esoteric or mystery schools and all the great faiths, even if it, even if it is the Jewish faith or the Christian faith or any of the large world religions, you go into the depths of the esoteric traditions or the mystical traditions within these religions. And you essentially, again, you're finding the same thing, same type the ice cream just different flavors and it largely again revolves around your connection to your heart and understanding that your heart is the direct pathway to the divine or the direct pathway of the divine to you is through your heart and that's largely what the the gnostics were speaking about in in many different ways in many different cultures and many different traditions but that's the essence of of gnosis and the gnostics well let's go a little deeper into this idea i mean yeshua is a great a prime example of a Jewish man, and then Christianity is born <laughs> supposedly out of him and his teachings. So mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about the historical background, because one of your expertise is Joseph of Arimathea, and mm -hmm. he had significance, you say, in the life of Yeshua. Can you tell us about Joseph's historical background? 
Absolutely. Jo- Joseph to me is one of the, the greatest unsung hero of the entire biblical epic, because when we read the Bible, he's only referenced a few times. And just when you read the Bible and you only see him pop up a few times, you don't necessarily associate him with anything very important, you know, very, you could say meaningful necessarily, even though he was the one to take the body down from the cross. He was the one to liaise between Pontius Pilate and some of the authorities. He he played some important roles, but nothing of a grand scale, most people would say. And it wasn't until I really dove deeply into understanding the entire bi- biblical story, both before the time of Jesus, during the time of Jesus, and especially after the time of Jesus, after the crucifixion, you suddenly see that Joseph was front and center. In many ways, Joseph was the axis point in which the whole story revolved around. And he was a man who not only was incredibly wealthy, right? He was incredibly, you could say he was kind of like a Carnegie of the ancient world because Joseph he controlled the largest private merchant fleet in the entire world. And he was responsible for delivering tin, lead, and other minerals and metals around the world. So he amassed a massive fortune. You know, he was always considered or spoken about as a wealthy or a very rich man. So on a financial or monetary level, he had an incredible amount of power and influence. But also he was a very political person as well, where he was both in the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish kind of political body at the time. But he was also was known as a nobilis decorion. So he had a very important title within the Roman or, or the Roman political structure. So if we're just looking on a kind of a material or, or worldly level, Joseph of Arimathea was one of the wealthiest and also extremely politically powerful people in the area at that time. And then if we go to the esoteric or the spiritual levels, Joseph was Christed in his own right. Joseph was a Christed being, a very spiritually advanced being in his own right. And he was both advanced and initiated through the kind of Essene tradition of ancient Palestine and Israel, but he was also an arch druid or fully initiated as an arch druid throughout the druidic culture. So here is a man that has, you know, so many fingers and so many different pies, yet he was such a humble man, a man of service, a man who really sought to bring about light in the world. And so he, when we start to reframe and re-meet Joseph, we're suddenly becoming aware of just how amazing he was. And I say that as a role model for us men. And then we start to see his association with many of the members of the Holy Family, where after the crucifixion, he became known as Paranymphos, or guardian of both Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. So we're suddenly, okay, wow, he had a huge responsibility being guardian of these two incredibly important women. And then bringing us back to how does he get connected to Jesus? Well, they say Joseph Arimathea is his uncle or great uncle. So depending on the kind of sources and scriptures you look at, he is either the great uncle or uncle. I believe personally, he was the uncle of Jesus. And how he is the uncle through his lineage is that Joseph's mother, Joseph Arimathea's mother was known as Anna. So Anna is a, or Saint Anne, she's a very important priestess figure. And, you know, I'm not sure if we'll have time to go into her, but she's very important, very influential. Um, If you want to know more about her, there's a great book, even though it's channeled in fiction, it's called Anna, Grandmother of Jesus, a beautifully written book. And so Anna was the mother, both of Joseph of Arimathea and of Mother Mary. So Mother Mary and Joseph Arimathea were half siblings. They shared the same mother. They just had different fathers. And so he is connected to this very important bloodline. Now, when Joseph was younger, and it's hard to say the exact age, but most people, the consensus is somewhere around the year 10 years old to 12 years old, Jesus's father, who's also called Joseph, died and we're not exactly sure how he died there's many different theories but he essentially passed away now in the jewish tradition when a father passes away the next or closest kind of male kid steps up and becomes the guardian or the provider the protector of, of that family and so joseph arimathea essentially would have adopted jesus he would have become like a father figure to jesus 
And this really helps explain a lot of the associations between Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea throughout Jesus's life. But most importantly, we know Joseph of Arimathea was constantly traveling the world, you know, making sure he was managing his uh, mineral and metal trade business for the Roman Empire and, re- and liaising between them. But we have to understand Joseph wasn't just in it for the business. He was also connecting in spiritual levels, delivering scripture, delivering scrolls of knowledge, bringing initiates from place to place. So he was he really was doing many things on many different levels. And if his job was to be guardian of Jesus, really like a second father, an adopted father, Jesus would have spent a lot of time with Joseph, which means the ability for Jesus to travel the world and go with his uncle to many different places, including ancient Britain, really helps solidify and make sense of that story that maybe people would just dismiss as as fantasy. Wow. I, I just want to be clear, like I keep getting goosebumps. I literally, as you talk, I keep getting a rush in goosebumps. It's Mm -hmm. very interesting to listen to this information. So just want to breathe in everything you're saying right now. It's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's it's a lot. We're kind of diving in quickly into a huge subject. That's one of the reasons why I'm writing a book about it. (laughs) No, and thank you for diving because this makes it so fascinating like it's it is a mind explosion but it's a feast and i'm enjoying it so you're talking about that yeshua's father dies joseph of arimathea takes over he was the next closest of kin becomes his father figure but also a mentor is that correct he's Mm -hmm. a mentor and with all of what he's doing, you're talking about scrolls and, and people, and he's really moving in the spiritual world. Does he actually have influence over Yeshua's teachings? So, I mean, it's tough to, how do we mean influence? But he certainly helped expose Jesus to many teachings all around the world. He gave him access. He had the financial means to make sure Jesus had everything he needed from a physical level, from a worldly level. But he also, through Joseph, had access to a vast array of spiritual understanding, spiritual teachings, and most importantly, people. He was able through Joseph because Joseph was literally respected in every single place in the known world for one reason or another. Joseph carried with him a lot of respect. Uh, people really honored who Joseph was. So through Joseph and Joseph's connection, Jesus had access to incredible amounts of wisdom, of teaching, and of masters, of teachers, of, of people who would have brought you know more to to Jesus's life. And ultimately, by Jesus being exposed to all of these different spiritual traditions, spiritual teachings, it really helped then Jesus to form his, what would become later, his ministry, his teaching, his offering, his embodiment and transmission of the light. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really interesting to hear you say this, Oliver, because I'm thinking, oh, Mary Magdalene's family came from money. And because they had money, she was admitted into this sacred temple, right, Uh, where she did a lot of her studies. And it's very interesting that also Yeshua came from money because it gave them both access to deep spirituality and sacred rituals practices before they came together. Mm -hmm. That seems significant to me. They didn't come from nothing. Yeah, I mean, people like to imagine for one reason or another that, that Jesus was poor and he was destitute or didn't have a lot. But if we understand his direct connection to Joseph, Joseph was one of the wealthiest men in the entire world at the time, the entire known Western world at the time. And so he he was certainly not someone who was who was poor or or destitute. But we have to understand the way Joseph worked with his resources and his abundance. It wasn't like he was just hoarding it, keeping it for himself. He was spreading it around. He was constantly investing and sharing and supporting many different cultures, many different wisdom traditions, and certainly the Holy Family um, within their seen communities. Amazing. Can you elaborate on the significance of Joseph's connection to Glastonbury and also the legends surrounding the Holy Grail? Absolutely. Like that to me is there's two really exciting times when it comes to Joseph's mission. And to be honest, his whole life to me is exciting. But I really like focusing on two areas. One, of course, the time when he was with 
younger Jesus, adolescent Jesus, and taking him through his rites of passage and his spiritual initiations at that time in Jesus's life. And Joseph's, you could say, in my opinion, one of his most important missions is actually what took place after the crucifixion and what happened to many of the Holy Family, many of the disciples, and importantly, the grail, because the grail is one of those items that you could look at in different perspectives, understand it through different lenses. And Joseph became so important in the story of Christianity, long before it was ever called Christianity or considered Christianity, is Joseph was fundamental in creating what would be the first Christian school or the first Christian, even though they didn't call it Christian, church anywhere in the world, which was actually in the UK. And that's what most people don't even realize. It's one of those historical facts that flies under the radar. When we think of Christianity, we think of Rome, right? We always think, oh yeah, Roman Christianity, the Pope, the Vatican, all these different things. We think Rome is central to the foundations of the Genesis, the birth of Christianity, when it's actually couldn't be further from the truth. Truth. Because when the early foundations of what would later become Christianity, this mystery Christed school teachings, Rome actually persecuted the early Christians for hundreds of years. Rome was actually very anti-Jesus and anti-Christian for, for the first few centuries. And so what we like to do is we look at the story of the grail. We look at the story of the original holy family and the very important disciples. And we, we try to understand what happened immediately after the crucifixion. Where did these people go and what happened to this biblical epic? And that's where Joseph comes, again, front and center, because Joseph was the one who was chosen by Jesus to be guardian of Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, arguably the two greatest treasures at that time in, in terms of the Christ Christed epic. And so we know Joseph went back to the UK after the crucifixion. We know Joseph brought the grail to the UK after the crucifixion. And we know some of the disciples or holy family members, although they're not explicitly stated who they are, also went with Joseph to Glass or not Glastonbury to the UK. And what I find most important is if Joseph was the parent infos, the guardian of Mother Mary, he was chosen to protect and guard at all costs these two women. I find it highly unlikely that they wouldn't have also gone with him to the UK. And that's some of what I talk about in my book series coming up is the evidence is that perhaps Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, and many of the other members of the Holy Family and the disciples actually went with Joseph to the UK. But that's a big topic. I don't know if we can crack into that today. But speaking of the foundations of the Celtic Church, of the earliest foundations of Christianity, this happened in the UK. And so we have a lot of these legends that focus on a place called Glastonbury. You know, most people call it Avalon today as the spiritual name. And we're not actually sure if these legends truly took place in Glastonbury or if they took place in Wales. And, you know, I have my theories, I have my research you know, comparing the two. But what's important is we just think of it coming back to the lands of Albion, coming back to the lands of the UK. And when we go through history, what we find is there's this very important Welsh royal family called the Silurian royal family that Joseph was deeply connected to throughout his whole life. And members of the Silurian royal family were the first ones to officially set up, you could say, Christian teaching schools, that the first actual female saints of Christianity were from this Silurian royal family. And all of the Silurian royal apocrypha, the stories that connect to this family, talk about them being guardians of the grail. And because this was so far back in time, a lot of the stories that get connected to South Wales and to the Soyan royal family were kind of brought to different places in the UK, kind of told again, reassociated again. And some of the members of the family would actually travel to different places in the UK. So it's so old. And why I say that is a lot of it's convoluted and it's hard to get kind of historical accuracies pinpointed, but it's really about the essence. It's really about the energy. And we know for sure that Glastonbury, Avalon, the place that we'll be going to during the tour, so many of these legends get ascribed and infused into this place, not only because of its ancient Druidic significance, but because of the history and the archaeology that we have of very ancient churches that were created in Avalon.
And also, if we understand from a spiritual point of view, what Avalon is, what Avalon means, the different associations with it being a place between the realms, between the worlds, a very spiritually activated place, we can understand why the early Celtic Christians and why a lot of these legends get connected there, because why wouldn't you create a church there? Why wouldn't you use the natural earth energies that were already cultivated there from the times of the Druids to help enhance spiritual connections? Again, this is one of the reasons why we see so many early Celtic churches built on ancient Druidic places or on ancient Druid ley lines, because something about these places has power and can expand these energies. And we see written down in history a lot of references of Joseph going to Glastonbury, arriving to Glastonbury, although it didn't say Glastonbury specifically, it said Avalon or versions of the word Avalon, and we can interpret that in different ways. But what I love most is that there's a legacy of Christ to light that you feel in Glastonbury. And that's backed up at least as far back we know, archaeologically speaking, by the fourth century. We see these foundations of an early Christian mystical school there. And so Glastonbury holds those energies. Glastonbury really, in my opinion, helps people reframe Christ, Jesus, Christian teachings in a way that maybe isn't as traumatic and associated with Rome, but instead plugged into something that's much more pure, much more ancient, and much more rooted in the original teachings of Yeshua and of Mary Magdalene. Wow. I want to stop here because I know what I'd be thinking personally if I was watching this outside of you and I right now, and I'd be like, where can I take a class with this guy? You are a font of information, but I really appreciate how articulate you are, how incredibly well studied you are in these subjects, and how you're able to connect everything from historical times, but to modern times and implications. So are you offering anything or how do people work with you, Oliver? Absolutely. I, I do a, a few different things. Most of my joy or my passion is leading retreats. And so bringing people on pilgrimages to these sites and getting to help people connect to these ancient Druidic lineages, to the Druid energies, but also to help them connect into Celtic Christianity, which again, Celtic Christianity is the Christianity that existed before Roman Christianity. The Celtic church is the oldest church in the world. And it literally, Rome had to defer to the Celtic church for centuries before eventually Rome took over and let's just say changed many things. But I love bringing people into a new form of Christianity that they might not know existed because I think a lot of people resonate with the teachings of Jesus, of Yeshua, and of Mary Magdalene, and they feel a soul resonance. But of course, when you kind of go into modern day Christianity, it doesn't make sense. It's, it feels hollow in many ways. It feels empty, void of the original essence. So that's the other aspect that it really help, like pe to help people reconnect to is, is a very pure form of Christianity, a Christianity that's as much the earth as it is, is the heavens. And so I do that in retreats and bringing people on pilgrimage. But I also offer courses online where I have a number of courses online that people can take on my website. And I'll and see in the, in the future, I'll be doing many courses specifically, again, on these topics to help people, yeah, learn to be exposed to and many to, to help shift people's relationships to what's known as the Christ and, and the history of the Christ. And uh, well, uh, you and I are connected on Instagram. And I thought I saw that you just put something out. Is there a specific class that's about to roll out? Absolutely. Thanks for uh, bringing that up. Um, I'm just launching a course now called the Celtic Magdalene. And so I finished up a course uh, last month called the Celtic Church, going into a lot of the histories of the Celtic Church. And so many people in there really wanted to explore uh, an archetype of Mary Magdalene that I call the Celtic Magdalene, which is the Magdalene lineage that's connected into the UK and really birthed this impressive female priestess Christed path in the first century. And so the course that uh, is going to be launching very soon, it'll be launching May 3rd, is called the Celtic Magdalene, which will be yeah, exploring this Magdalene lineage. And really, what if Mary Magdalene had a very deep and you could say, important piece of history in the UK, in these ancient British lands, which I believe she did. And there's a lot of history to back that up. And so this course will be breaking that open and seeing how Mary Magdalene was so core and so key to the foundations of the early Celtic church. And most importantly, the teachings of the first female saints of Christianity. Oh my God, how wonderful and exciting. 
Celtic Mary Magdalene. Okay. And also on your website for folks who are interested. That that course is available right on the website if that's what you're asking. Yeah, sorry, the Gnosticdruid.com. Yeah, just the, not, the, oh yeah, the Gnosticdruid.com. Okay. Yeah, it's called the, the Celtic Magdalene is, is the course that's launching now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I want to skip a little bit to uh ancient language of Aramaic, which was spoken by Yeshua and also by the Essenes. I first wow, I first started speaking let's call it 13, 14 years ago. And I, at that time, I would speak about creating dreams because Dare to Dream, name of my show. And I started writing books, Dare to Dream, Wisdom to Success. So that was my thing back then, the magic of dreams and creating them. And I remember, well, for me back then, this was like gold and I used to share it when I spoke. Now it's a little bit more out there, but I like to think I found it first. And it was Aramaic. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. I wanted to find something that tied in the idea of creating dreams with something ancient. And mm -hmm. so that's when I found out the word abracadabra, which in yes. Aramaic was avra kadavra, which meant as I speak, I create. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, they have the secret. <laughs> they were able to say that in Aramaic terms. And I thought that was genius. So how does the understanding of this ancient Aramaic language deepen our teachings of Yeshua or Yeshua's teachings. What's the connection? Mm -hmm. I, I love Aramaic. I love that you've been exploring Aramaic. And I think a lot of people who encounter Aramaic, it's an instant recognition of something important. Even if you don't know what it is, you you know there's something there. There's some something there that's waiting to to be expanded, to be to be discovered. And why I found personally Aramaic was so important is because I really wanted to know what a lot of these biblical people were saying without any of the editing, right? Any of the translation errors that we have with the modern King James Bible, for instance. Because if we think about it chronologically in time, the modern Bible that we read in modern English today has been translated four, five, six times, and not only translated from older forms of English, but also understanding that it went from Aramaic to Greek, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to different variations of Old English to modern English. And one of the things that happens when you translate uh, scripture or you translate anything is you start to lose some of the nuance. You start to lose some of maybe the original essence of the meanings, specifically for the reason why there's there's not certain words for words in other languages. And we see that even in the first layer of translation of the Bible, when we go from the original Aramaic to Greek, there's not certain Greek words for Aramaic words. So they have to use approximations. They have to be like, oh, well, we don't have a Greek word for this word. So we'll, we'll try and make it work with this way. So even on the first layer of translations of the Bible, you're already losing some very important things. And we see that again happening into Latin and into variations of, of Old English and modern day English. And so I really want to know, okay, what are these people saying? I want to get to the Aramaic. And the Aramaic is so awesome because just like the Druids, there's not necessarily a 100% consensus. Aramaic, because it's such an ancient form of, of a Syriac language, there are many beautiful Aramaic scholars and teachers in the world right now, but no one can say with 100% certainty that this word means this that this word means this for sure. Because what you find as you get into Aramaic is it's a language that's structured in consciousness. And what I mean by that is your interpretation of it, you're receiving it, you're working with these words, you understanding and feeling these words largely dictates what you get out of these words. And that's one of the problems that you have with a lot of academics or scholars today that are translating Aramaic is they're doing it from an intellectual standpoint. They think, all right, this word and this variation of Hebrew should mean this. But they're missing that spiritual side. And of course, a lot of people who are working with Aramaic purely spiritually are kind of doing it in a way that's not anchored necessarily to the linguistic mechanics of Hebrew or various teachings of that time. So you kind of need to bring both hemispheres, right? Your head and your heart together 
to really open up Aramaic. And then when you do, you're suddenly brought into a connection to the essence of what Jesus and a lot of these biblical figures were actually talking about because you're going closer to the source. You're actually getting to the source of what they're saying and retranslating the words that have lost their meaning or maybe that the English words don't fully capture exactly what was being transmitted or emanated by these speakers when they're speaking in Aramaic. And so that's why Aramaic can be so beneficial to our biblical studies because you're brought in many ways to a more pure or original essence of the communication. Mm. Yeah, I was surprised to find out that Abba in Aramaic, I mean, that's, I was raised Jewish. So yeah, that means mm -hmm. father in Hebrew. I was really surprised mm -hmm. to find its inception was in Aramaic. And then mm -hmm. there's uh, other words like mamon, wealth mm -hmm. or material possessions. And another word found in Hebrew also that's Aramaic is Sabbath, the day mm. of rest. Very yeah. surprising how connected they are. So Absolutely. Well, Aramaic uses the, the Hebrew alphabet. So that's why you can really find that that connection. And and there's such easy, not always easy, but there's there's many easy crossovers between the two. Mm. I know, Oliver Huntley, that you can recite the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And I believe you also offer a transmission when you do yeah. that. Would you do that for us? Of course. Well, what, how about for your audience today? What if we learn some of the Lord's Prayer in, in Aramaic and we can teach someone so you can really start to chant it and, and speak it um, in your own time, in your own way, and really bring yourself again into a connection with part of the Lord's Prayer. So before I go into the Lord's Prayer, one of the things I always like bringing people into the awareness of is something that Jesus would say. And he, Jesus would say something very specifically before he would do any of his healing work. So we always have these references in the Bible of Jesus would do his healing work. And we think it, he's just healing them or he's using his magical Reiki powers or something like that. But he would say something in Aramaic before he would begin his healing. And I like to start with it before I do any Aramaic work because it seems to really transmit the essence of what we're doing nowadays, which is to become open. And so Jesus would say this one Aramaic word, which is the word eighth batak, eighth batak, eighth batak. And so he would stand before someone with his hands up to him and he would say eighth batak, eighth batak. And what that translates as is to become open or to become empty, be open or be empty. And what he meant by that is that not necessarily he was doing the healing, but you could say his father or really divine spirit was going to do the work on the person if they were open, if they were empty. Because if we think as people, we're already so filled, right? Our cup is already filled. We're already defined. We already have our mental constructs. We already have our belief systems. And many times our intellectual belief systems, our emotional belief systems, all the constructs of all of our different bodies, because they're so rigid and fixed already, it doesn't allow a lot of alchemy or transformation in our lives. So if we really want to shift things, if we really want to heal, if we really want to restore or return to an original or divine template within our own field, we need to become open. We need to become empty. We need to return to that eighth batak, eighth batak. So if anyone listened to this, if you feel yourself stuck, you're in a stagnant way, or you can't seem to shift something or move something, you can intone this, you know, say it silently within your own being, or you can say it out loud, eighth batak, eighth batak. And that will help return you into that open state, that empty state which is actually something very important in the second line of the Lord's Prayer that we're about to go into now. So when we have the Lord's Prayer, I love the Lord's Prayer because even in English, it's a beautiful prayer. And it's very different in English than it is in Aramaic. So I highly encourage people to, one, learn the Lord's Prayer in English, but also research it in Aramaic. I have a great course on my website, too, if you're curious, that takes you through the Lord's Prayer line by line, word by word, teaching you how to speak it and chant it. But again, with Aramaic, you're going to find widely different interpretations, widely different translations from different people. So just go with the one that feels right to you, the one that feels in resonance to you. And so the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, it's like a systematic way of helping you return or erect your light body to return to that state of being that connects directly to God. And it's purely there in the Aramaic. We don't really see it again as much in the English, but it's really present in the Aramaic. 
And so when we think of Aramaic, we'll do the first two lines, because again, I want to be conscious of the time for you. When we think of Aramaic, we go into it and we can open up Aramaic words. And so what I mean by that is you have an Aramaic word, but the word isn't necessarily just the word itself. The meaning of the word can be found when you open up the components of each Aramaic word, similar to how you know in Hebrew, you know, the letters can also mean numbers. And depending on where the letters are and how they're put together, you can get different emanations out of the word. And so Aramaic, I describe it to people, they're like hieroglyphics. And so you can really open up each Aramaic word into its components. And it becomes like a landscape that you get to walk through. You get to see different seed sounds coming together and creating different experiences that then you get to receive vibrationally. And so Aramaic, like many of the ancient seed languages all around the world, it's about the resonance and it's about the vibration and what that does to your consciousness. Literally, these seed sounds, both in Sanskrit and Aramaic and Hebrew as well, they they're like playing an instrument they're playing your consciousness plucking different strings that awakens things so you can understand aramaic on an intellectual level you can receive oh, okay i know this word means this but you can feel what the words mean you vibrate them so you're going to get this full spectrum of aramaic depending on how you want to work with it and how you want to receive it and so when we start with the lord's prayer right you have the first line our father who art thou in heaven that's the common english one in Aramaic, it goes, Abun de Boishmaya. Abun de Boishmaya. Abun de Boishmaya. And what we'll do is we'll kind of take the first two words and we'll open them up. We'll play with them. We'll get to feel into what they mean. And you have the first word, Abun. And you have this first part, Ab, and then the Un part. And so again, with Aramaic, even if you don't feel like you're saying it correctly, it's totally okay. What's important is that each of the syllables, right? Each of the kind of almost the vowel-like sounds, that's what you want to intone with and resonate with. So you have the ab and the un. And so it commonly gets translated our father, right? We think our father, which puts already kind of a masculine kind of lens on the divine. But something's very interesting when you break open abun is you have the aleph and the bet, the A and the B letters. And when you put those letters together, you're not necessarily being brought into something that's father or masculine. The ways the aleph and the bet come together, the A and the B, it actually creates this encompassing understanding of creation or creative force, creative faculty divine essence and so it's not necessarily being gendered just masculine you're getting this sense of source of creator and then the un at the end is what's the r comes from like r but it's not a possessive r it's not like our father my father what it's saying is something that's connected to it all so it's the full essence of all of creation, all of the divine construct. It's like, what is that force of spirit that connects to everything and holds everything together? That our spirit, our father, our creative essence. Moving into the second word, Deboashmaya, Deboashmaya, which is heaven. Right. So when we're talking about our father who art thou in heaven, we're talking about this divine creative energy that's connected to everything, what everything is birthed out of and what everything returns to that is of heaven. Deboishmaya. And when we open up the word heaven, heaven is very interesting because you have what's known as the kingdom of heaven. Right. And when we look at the Bible, we have two things that oftentimes get associated together as the same one, but they're actually very different. You have the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And people think, oh, that's the same thing. But in Aramaic, these are very different things. And so you have the kingdom of God, and we probably don't have time to talk about that today, but the kingdom of heaven, because we're talking about heaven. What's interesting is when you say that in Aramaic, kingdom of heaven, Malkuta Dashmaya, you have something where Malkuta, kingdom, is actually a feminine word. And that's why oftentimes people translate it as queendom of heaven, which is a cool way to translate it. But it doesn't necessarily just mean feminine as it's a like king or queen. That ta, malku ta, the ta at the end is what engenders it feminine. And when you have a feminine Aramaic word, it shifts it from being a noun or a place into an experience, like an adverb or an adjective. So, for instance, if the masculine word was fire, the feminine version of that would be the heat that you feel coming from the fire, right? So it's not the thing itself, it's the experience. So when you have 
the kingdom of heaven, Malkuta, it's not talking about a place. It's talking about a vibration of heaven. And so when you see the biblical references, Malkuta Adashmai, kingdom of heaven, it's really helping you call into a vibrational state of a certain quality like heaven. So now let's open up heaven. Let's open up Deb Maya. What does it mean? What is it doing? And so you have Deb Maya, and a very interesting word pops up in the middle of Deb Maya. Maya, Maya. And so that's a common word that we hear a lot of different spiritual communities. And most often it gets associated with either the Sanskrit or the South American meaning, which largely revolves around illusion or falsity or being lost or not seeing clearly. But Maya in Aramaic is the word for water. It's the Aramaic word for water. And when we look at the Aramaic and especially the Essene or Gnostic understandings of reality, what you have is this idea that just like in science, we have physical reality, solid, then we have liquid, then we have gas. In the same way in the Gnostic world, in the spiritual way, we have the physical manifest world. Then we have the gas, which is like the divine, the God realms. And then you have the water, which is the conduit or the medium that connects the two. And so why that's important, Maya, and especially in the concept of heaven, is because heaven is understanding that it's a vibration that you can connect into that is literally the vehicle which brings earth to the divine and from the divine to earth. It is that conduit. It is that medium that we go into that. And so the first line of the Lord's Prayer, Abun de Boashmaya, our Father who art there in heaven, is more aptly translated along the lines of honoring the creator, the source, the energy that is all and everything, everywhere, all at once, throughout all time and space. And understanding that that is the energy that then communicates from these divine realms into physical reality and from physical reality into the divine realms. And so really the first line of the Lord's Prayer is an honoring to the divine as the space setting or the foundational reality of spirit that we get to plug ourselves into and to see how that moves us into what the second line of the Lord's Prayer will then talk about or what we do in order to connect with this all-encompassing spirit. And before I go into that, how are we doing for time? Do we have time to go into the second line? Um, if you could do it quickly, that would be great. Because yeah, yes, we're we're pretty much at the end. But this is okay. magnificent information. Oh, okay. That, again, it's it's so hard to briefly break open all these words. But I'll just say that the second line, you know, our Father who art thou in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I love this hallowed be thy name because you open it up. What does that mean? What are they talking about? Hallowed be thy name. Is it hollow? Is it is it holy name? What is that? And then in Aramaic, you have abun de boashmaya going into the second line, neth kadash shmok. Neth kadash shmok. And shmok comes from shem, which you might have heard of shem, which is or name. Israel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like you translate it. Exactly. Kadush, yeah. So the different understandings of holy in there. And you have Shem, which translates on the surface as name, but really it's divine essence. It's that true blueprint that's at the core of our soul that really is the symbol of who we are. And then you have the Neth Kadash Shemak. And it's the holy aspect, but really it's about going back into that eighth Batak, this idea of becoming hollow, becoming empty, becoming a vessel or conduit. So how does God's name really, what it is, is it's the divine template. How do we become open, empty? How do we become a vessel or grail for God's name, the divine essence, the true template of the divine to flow through us? So we honor God in the first line of it, understand what God is, and then what is the first protocol we take to becoming a vehicle or a conduit or a vessel in which God's name, true essence, then communicates and comes through us? Okay. So here is yet another reference to shamanism. When we learn to be shamans and do shamanic practices and healings, one of the things that our mentors teach us, and I think it's really significant, they tell us we are hollow bones. Mm, yes. So we get out of the way. This is one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that has helped me tremendously. When I started healing, uh, working on people, in a healing way, I know every time I was getting to the crest, 
the inception of like, okay, opening up to what's happening with them so I can help facilitate change. Inherently, I would go into my head, how would I know this stuff? And it was um, like, it probably took seconds, but the head would take over and then immediately I would hear that voice, you are but a hollow bone. And I mm. would get out of the way and allow whatever to come through. And of course, whenever it did, and whether I was, uh, you know, it depends on the practice. I was sharing with the person at the time or we waited till they were done and I brought them back out. I was able to share this information, what I received. And no matter what it seemed like, like what in the world is this that makes no sense, I would always go mm -hmm. with it. And then that person, the client would say to me, that is unbelievable because X, Y, Z, of course it was very valid. So this is so beautiful to hear you say this, that the Druids themselves talked about shamanically, they would say, be a hollow bone. So in other mm -hmm. words, the channel, the conduit, the tube for all this light and wisdom and goodness to come through. And then we truly are the creators and the co-creators. Absolutely. And not just for the divine to come through, but for us to go to the divine then, or for the earth then to connect to heaven. It's all about that hollowness, the hollow bone. Oh, that is so beautiful, <laughs> Oliver. Wow. Okay. I love that you um, dropped little seeds through this, like the Anna, the priestess, and that, oh, we could do a, well, the rest of the lines of this beautiful prayer. So, okay. You know, maybe that will just have to happen in the future. And uh, folks, I just want to tell you, there's going to be links in the show notes. There's a link to Oliver's thegnosticdruid.com. Remember, gnostic druid.com and also to the ascension glastonbury that we are speaking at and there are many other amazing people tim tactics who was on the show last week phenomenal neil gore is going to be there and tons of people you want to learn from that little link for the tickets will also be in the show notes so you can join us so you are going to be what oliver speaking at the portal to ascension glastonbury uk conference what are you doing there what can folks yeah, so i'll be uh I'll be leading a talk there uh and as well as leading a group of people around avalon for uh, a retreat experience so if you're coming to the conference you'll hear me speaking and then there's an optional uh, Glastonbury Avalon retreat. So if you're someone who loves going to places, spiritual, sacred sites, connecting with the energies, this is going to be a great opportunity for you, not only just to come and I'll be leading us to these places, but getting to share some stories, some folklore, some transmissions, helping you connect more deeply to the history of these places. I can't wait. And Oliver, okay. this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, to be as great of a father as I can be with my little child being born later this year. So my big prayer, not only to myself stepping into fatherhood and rising into that, but also to all the men out there who are either fathers now and are growing in their beautiful ways, or to all the fathers to be out there. I just pray that the masculine can just rise fully into their hearts and to help birth, you know, these children that will be stewarding and ushering in the new world. Amen. That's beautiful. Thank you. And um, I hope to see your little one, your little dragon baby, because baby born in the year <laughs> of the dragon, how significant, I think. And I think so beautiful to be putting these powerful children onto the earth right now. Um, thank you so much, Oliver. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share with your audience. Thank you. Yeah. You delivered. Well, I end today's show with this quote. Uh, the ancient order of Druids, AOD, is the oldest neo-Druid order in the world. It was formed in London, England in 1781, and its motto is justice, philanthropy, and brotherly love. We could use some of that on the earth right now. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show is going to be one of the most respected sound healers in the world today, author and channeler, Tom Kenyon. Thank you so much for joining us today. And remember to be that hollow bone. <laughs>